Hi everyone, my name is Peter Luongo and I am honored to be able to be here thanks to the NAM Foundation for giving us an opportunity to carry on a dialogue that we started in January around teaching ukulele. The ukulele symposium that we held at that time gave us a chance to start a discussion and we're gonna continue it today with three very special guests. I'm gonna ask you to welcome and bring on to the studio uh, Roy and Kathy Sakuma and Jake Shimabukuro. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha, you Aloha. guys. It's Aloha. so great. Hi, Jake. Hi, Jake. Hi, Jake. Hi, Jake. Peter. Uh, hi, Peter. Aloha, everyone from Hawaii. Yeah. I feel warmer just knowing that you guys are on with me. This is fantastic. <laughs> I'm so nervous. Uh, this is going to be great. <laughs> well, listen, I think I can break down the nervousness beautifully. Jake, you're not going to believe this. Uh, we have a clip that's going to set up this entire dialogue. And Roy, at the end of it, I'm gonna ask you to talk about your ukulele method. Kathy, you might not recognize the young man in the clips. It's your <laughs> husband, Roy. All right, Eric, take it away. Let's play this. I always had a fascination for the ukulele, but every time I tried to learn, I could never get anywhere because my friends would tell me, you know, you, you just can't do it. But it wasn't until 1963, and I believe I was 16 years old when I heard a song called Sushi on the radio. And that was a song recorded by Ota-san. And I went to see him, and uh, thankfully, he said that he would teach me, and that's how it all started. But he was so good that after 18 months, I told him to quit <laughs> because I said, that's all I can teach you. I taught you everything I knew, you know. The rest is up to you. About six months later, he called me and says, would you like to come and help me? I'm teaching adults on Saturday. Roy had this passion to teach the ukulele. And with uh, Otosan's blessing, Roy opened up a ukulele studio right next door to Otosan's studio. When Roy first started teaching, I remember him telling me that there's a point where he reached a, a roadblock in, um, in getting the kids to play music and read the music. And he thought, there has to be a, another way of doing this. It just hit me. Why not use the notes of the alphabet? Because the kids are used to that. They grow up from the infant learning their alphabets. I think if it wasn't for this method, that, that we wouldn't have um, so many kids coming in and just enjoying making music. We ended up teaching seven days a week but we loved it. Today, uh, we have about 35 instructors. All our instructors are all former students of ours. Uh, we have instructors who've been with us since they're five years old and they're now working full time with us. Yeah, he's just taught me a lot. I mean, when I first started as a child, you know, taking lessons five years old and then growing up with him. Yeah, he's just, he's just a generous man. I really look up to him. We've had so many students that have gone on to professional musical careers. Jake Shimabuko. Jake was a student here at this studio for seven years. We that has beautifully set up this dialogue, <laughs> you guys. Wonderfully done. And yeah, did you recognize, Kathy, did you recognize that young guy? <laughs> Not so much. There's a lot more white hair now. <laughs> yeah, and the mustache is gone. Thank goodness yeah, for yeah, that. Yeah, That's all yeah. I could say. Yeah. 50 oh, you guys years. haven't aged at all. You guys look so good. Oh, my uh, God. Well, oh my Kathy, God. Kathy, anyway. Kathy. Yes, that's right. that's right. 50 years of ukulele teaching to thousands of students, young and old. Roy's method has led to students, children, achieving their first success with music, and Roy and Kathy as a team started in 1971, a festival that has become world famous. I, I've been blessed enough to be able to be part of it. Uh, I've brought both students, children, as well as adults to perform. So you know what, Roy, let me throw it over to you and Kathy. Tell us a little bit about your method and how you guys set up your studio. Well, and when I looked at that clip, it brought back so many, so much memories because when I did start teaching, I was actually teaching through uh, music sheets, like how you would play music on the piano. And uh, I, uh, on, on, when the songs became a little more difficult, I had a difficult time of communicating with the children how to play. And that's when I said, Kathy, there has to be an easier way. And using the, the alphabets, I was able to design it in a way where the kids could learn the song and still kind of grasp 
the melody to what what we were trying to communicate and then it snowballed from there that was the beginning of how uh, our method just took off because now we could teach anyone we, we could teach anybody anybody how to play the ukulele mm -hmm. so it, it, it encompassed both the ear training as well as the the notes on the page Yes, and I remember Jake sharing something about our uh, method. I, I think Jake should share it because he, he said it really well, Jake, about you know, the manual typewriter. <laughs> yeah, yeah you know, Uncle Roy is so humble, right? So, but he, I mean, in my eyes, I mean, he was such a genius because um, <laughs> back then we didn't have word processors or you know, these computers or software programs where you can just simply notate music the way that we do today. Mm -hmm. So he had this idea because he could already read standard notation. He invented really a way to um, dictate not just the, the notes with using lowercase and capital uh, letters, but also using symbols to dictate rhythm. And because he only had access to a typewriter, he would use things like the dashes and the equal signs and the dots. And what all those things represented was if he had two note names, like say C and C, if he had put a dash in between, that's like the dash, the one dash that connects, you know, the, um, the notes on a, um, the stems of a note on, on music notation. So that would indicate uh, you would play them as quarter notes. Now, I mean, I, I'm sorry, as eighth notes. Right. If there wasn't a dash, they would be quarter notes. If yeah. there were 16 notes, he would use the equal sign because then it's two <laughs> two lines, right? Wow. And then for a dotted eighth, he would actually use a period with the with the with the um the 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 uh, the dash. So, wow. it, I mean, it it was so brilliant, uh -huh. and um and then he would use uh, these slashes as like either um as like a quarter rest, or in some cases we would use those as a, as a symbol to strum like a downstroke right on the, on the next beat. So it was just so brilliant. And then the, um, and then as you know, the ukulele in standard tuning with the mm -hmm. re-entrant tuning, it's mm -hmm. only two octaves. So your lowest note is the third string, which is middle C on the yep. piano. And then, you know, and then you have, uh, you have two C's above that, yes. right? So most of your, your higher, uh, the higher register of the ukulele is all played on the first string. And wow. what he did with that first string, all the notes that are played in that first string from the, from the A above middle C to that second C above, he would use uh, capital letters instead wow. of lowercase. Mm -hmm. So whenever you saw a capital letter, you knew that was up in the upper register. When you saw a lowercase letter, that was in the lower register, which, would, which was normally played on the, on the third uh, and second string. Wow. So there's standard notation and Sakuma notation. Yes. Sakuma yes. notation. Exactly. I love it. Now, now, Kathy, did you like, did you guys have extra sessions where you learned to, to read this Sakuma notation or? It, it evolved so um, gradually in it, in it, and he perfected it. Uh, but it, it immediately opened the door for any child or anybody to come in and immediately have, you know, within four lessons, feel like they're an instant ukulele player. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I, I, um, we acknowledged that it was quite a controversial mm -hmm. method. But our intent was just to expose young kids to the joy of playing and uh, creating music. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what we were able to do with Roy's method. I think it opened up the door so they didn't get turned off to it. Mm -hmm. And I, I, they just kept every year, they just would continue their lessons. See, one of the things that I really wanted to do was from lesson number one, whether the child was five years old or was an adult, is to teach them to play the melody already. Yes. And that's what we did. That's what we succeeded in doing. And as Kathy said, within those first four lessons, you can take a five-year-old child and now by the end of the fourth lesson, they can play a whole song, Yeah, you know? And that started it. That yeah, was it's, it. About, it's about success, isn't it? It's about them mm -hmm. feeling successful. Jake, you were gonna yes. add something. Yeah, I wanted to add, I mean, that's what I appreciated so much about my lessons there because from day one, I was already picking mel melodic 
notes. You know, I, I was playing melodies to songs like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star or Boogie Woogie, things like that. And because when I first picked up the ukulele, I was four years old and my mom, uh, who played, you know, taught me basic chords. So I would strum and then of course my mom could sing, but I didn't like to sing when I was growing up. So <laughs> sometimes if I were strumming a song, no one could recognize the song I was playing. Right. And I remember my cousin, Cappy, uh, he came over to our house one day and he was a student of, of Roy, you know, Roy Sukuma, uh, Roy Sukuma's school. And he was playing, he played the, um, the theme from Rocky because Roy would write out all these great movie themes too. So he was playing the, the Rocky theme. And I remember watching him and I was like, wow, you know, how, how did you learn that? And he, you know, he, and he was, uh, so my uncle told my mom, oh yeah, you know, he's at, he's taking lessons from Roy Sukuma. So my mom was like, oh, so my mom knew Roy from back in the day. So she got me in and, uh, and I started taking lessons. And I remember from day one, I was already learning how to pick. And that was like, my, my goal was, it's like, oh, I want to learn how to pick, you know, single line melody, like a guitar player or something. And so mm -hmm. I think his method really inspired me from the beginning. So it made me want to play more, you know, it made, once I learned how to play my first song, I was hooked and I just, I didn't want to stop, you know, it was, there was no discouragement at, at all. And I find it fascinating, you guys, because we think about ukulele players who their first go-to is to want to strum. And yet, Roy, what you, Kathy, and Jake have all said is that your method is predicated on the idea of learning melody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, and, and, that's the number one. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. of course, by the way, it's what we do in Canada too. So you're mm -hmm. like, we're in total agreement. R Roy, how did you go about selecting repertoire? What did you do to pick what you picked? Uh, I would, in those days, the kids would come to me and say, have you heard this song? And Kathy would buy these cassette tapes because that's what it was back to the cassette tape. So I'd have to listen to all these different songs. And fortunately, I had learned how to listen to music and figure out the chords and the notation. So that's how I would write my songs way back then. And now we have um, thousands of songs that I've written out for ukulele. And so a lot of times when I listen to a song, it's in A flat or or. or a key not really comfortable for ukulele. Right. And knowing that we're teaching primarily children, I adjusted the song to fit the scope of the child, you know, so that they can play it. Yeah. It wasn't about making it, ex define it exactly where it's so complicated, you know, the, the key was to m make it fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the key, yeah. Wow. Well, no Kathy, in, in the clip that we heard, you talked about the number of teachers that are, are in the program. Are they, um, do they all develop this through playing, through taking the lessons? And then of course they're uh, competent enough to be able to teach it this way? It's just the way things started. You know, people weren't teaching ukulele at that time. So it's not like you could reach out outside and, and hire ukulele teachers. Mm. So it was our students. And as they uh, developed with us, then if we saw the potential or if they had the desire to to teach, then um, then we would train them as young as 12 years old. They would start volunteering and coming in until they were um, of age where we could hire them. So all of our instructors, all of them have been are all former students. So they've grown up with us. They know us. And basically what we've taught them is what they will pass on to the students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's such a lesson in mentorship, young people mentoring other young people. Uh, very powerful, very powerful. Well, I've, I've briefly introduced Roy and Kathy. Uh, I don't know that the audience needs an introduction for Jake. Uh, the, the one name says it all. Started at age four at Roy and Kathy's studio, redefined, he's redefined the amazing music that can be made on the ukulele from three chords to touring and performing for royalty, the queen, mm -hmm. uh, some of the iconic stages in the world and, and an inspiration to ukulele players all over the world. Jake, what, what was it like for you to evolve from what you were learning with Roy and, and at the studio with Roy and Kathy and then to, to grow from there? How did that work for you? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, even though I grew up learning Uncle Roy's method, um, 
because Uncle Roy was so prolific at reading music notation and he was so, uh, he had such a great understanding of music theory and all the things that a great musician, you know, should know. Um, he's the one who really inspired me to, to learn beyond, you know, what I was playing. I mean, just beyond the letter names on the paper and things like that. And, you know, he would sit down with me and explain to me, well, you know, well, you know why this is a, a C major um, and not a C minor or, you know, he, and coming from learning the basic single note approach, you know, once he told me that, well, chords are just when you take these single notes and you put them together, that's how you form these chords. And, you know, this kind of light bulb went off. So I, I think, you know, he's, he, of course he, um, you know, his understanding of music is so, great but what he can do what a lot of people can't do is he knows how to simplify it and present it in a way to students like myself so that we can get a a, a quick a quick grasp on it mm -hmm. and uh and then we're able to play right away and that's the thing right the the quicker we can get to playing and and have that feeling that that joy you know the um the, the, the feeling of success, their love and hope, you know, that yeah. they're always talking about. Yeah. Once you feel that, that's the part that's, that's, um, you know, a, addictive in a way. Right. And it yes. to, and you want to pick it up. You want to play, you want to, you feel so connected with the instrument. So, I mean, it's, it's, it was so, so brilliant. And I think it not, it not only taught a lot of people how to play the ukulele, mm. but it taught a lot of us um, to love, music yeah and to mm -hmm. me that's the, that's the bigger that's yeah. the bigger uh takeaway yeah, there's some wonderful messages here for those who are music teachers listening in just some wonderful examples roy as as you've gone through the 50 years you and kathy with the school how how has it evolved how has it changed over that time well i'm going to give this to kathy because she has such a great insight of this over the years and is always sharing with me just the joy of what she's witnessed in all these years? I, I think basically the, um, you know, our mission is the same, uh, but we do tell our young uh, staff to remember, everyone has their own story why they're coming in to take lessons. Hmm. And, and uh, we instill in them that, you know, decades from now when they're gone and they look back upon their lessons, I don't think they're going to remember, oh, I learned uh, this cool song. I think they're going to remember the connection they had with their instructor. Mm -hmm. um, that's, what's, that's what's going to stay with them and move them forward in life. Mm -hmm. So we, um, as teachers, it's making that connection to each, each student. Um, not everybody's there to... to they all have their reasons for being there. So we try to create a really safe place for any child or student to just feel really safe when they come to their lessons. Mm. Yes. No, she says it so, so really well because, and you know, um, and to all your teachers out there uh, through all the years that we've been teaching, and, and you folks know this, Peter and Jake, that everyone, um, uh, they, they learn differently musically. Some are good at reading music, some are good at listening, some are good at memorizing. And we as teachers have to find the road to get to them because one of the things uh, Kathy and I always tell our instructors, when a student does not understand what we're teaching, then it's up to us to change the direction of how we are approaching that student because they may not get it the way others would get it. Yeah. And, and this is the beauty of music. And I've learned this also from teaching a lot of children in, in my young years. I was asked to help children with special ed needs, with mm. all different types of special needs. And this is where I really learned how to connect with all these kids, kids that, you know, like the boy that didn't have an arm, the, the children that are in, in wheelchairs and have very little mobility in their fingers. Yet we could teach them. It was just if you have the love in your heart for teaching, you'll find a way. You yeah. will. You know, Roy, I listen to you with such admiration. I'm a trained educator. I went to university to do it. And everything that you're talking about is right on. It mm -hmm. is exactly what we learn as 
educators learning to be educators about empathy, about thinking the child that when the child doesn't get it, we change what we do. The child will adapt if we understand their learning style. And that's what you're talking about. It's wonderful, wonderful insight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. In, in terms of materials, how have those evolved over the years, the materials that you use? Oh, well, there's so much, but you know, like as Jake was saying in the early years, I simplified the music to help the kids. And as the years went by, uh, as, as children became more, more interested in the ukulele, it expanded the need for more difficult music. And then here comes Jake with his flying away style <laughs> that, okay, now I really got to figure out how to write these things out, you know. But now it's, it's we, we've done everything. I mean, you name the genre of music, it can be Latin, uh, bossa nova, jazz, uh, classics, anything. I, I, I'm pretty sure I have it in my file because that's, that's what we teach. You know, I think that's from the influence of what you learned from Otasan. Otasan was a huge influence on me. So my style of teaching, I mean, if I had to play at home by myself and just be comfortable, I would play a melody, but probably every note would have a chord on it. Mm -hmm. Because that's the way Otasan played, you know, right. basically. Yeah. You know, and, and that's just one style. But look at Jake's style, look at Herb Ota Jr. I mean, this everybody today is coming up with new style. Mm -hmm. Great. You know, we hope that everyone will play the ukulele someday throughout the world. That would be great. Well, you speak of that, and I'm going to set up the next clip for everybody because you actually give a chance for people to come and play in Hawaii. But you started a festival in 1971, and the clip's going to come here. It must have had a predominant role of giving an, an opportunity for your students at Sakuma Studios to be able to play. So as soon as we're done showing this clip, I want you to talk a little bit about the history of it. And Jake, I want you to wade in with how it's impacted musicians in Hawaii, but around the world to be able to participate in the festival. Eric, take away the clip, please. And there's, and there's the drummer at the end. Yeah, got to love it. Talk to us a little bit about the start of the festival, how that came to be. And, and again, everybody watching that would have seen this massive group of young people making music. What a great, great event. I, I just want to share this. When, when I saw that clip, I didn't know this is the clip you're going to show. But um, uh, well, right now, I, I'm, I'm really touched. And um, so if I kind of... Uh, Go off, sorry, but that song was written by a gentleman that I met some years ago, back in the 1980s, and we were sitting in this nightclub to listen to him play, and there was so packed that my wife had offered the two seats we had for a mother and daughter. They were the wife and son of this great, great guitarist, who's one of the greatest jazz guitarists in the world, Howard Roberts. Mm. That's the only clip, one of the few clips we cannot find. So when Howard came to the festival, we, I wrote that song called The Quest. That was the rhythm part where Howard just took off. We can't find that clip. <laughs> and that's why it's so touching to me because that song was written especially for him to come on stage and perform with us. Wow. The song called The Quest. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Fantastic. And, it, go, me, ahead. Na, go ahead, Kathy. Yes. Uh, what's the question? <laughs> well, just j just in terms of talking about all those students and, and using the festival as an opportunity for students to be able to come up on stage and be successful and to share the music making that they had from the studio. Yeah, you know, I, I, I wish back in those days, uh, 70s and 80s, I wish we had um, the iPhone camera like we do now because so much of uh, our history is not documented on video. Hmm. Um, there's yeah a lot 
and when it, when when we first started it was really small it you know at that time people weren't really interested in the ukulele it felt like um i mean we were basically doing it because it was roy's dream and mm. i i wanted to help him and um never thinking well i never thought it would ever take off but we did it you know it was like a a one hour one hour program then it became two hours the parents would come and they would just throw flowers on the stage and set it up uh they pretty much you know it was like a big family picnic back in those days mm -hmm. but it's it's um just evolved i i think the heart of the ukulele festival uh the birth of it is definitely the dream of um you know exposing it to everybody and showing you know the what the ukulele can do but i feel that the heart of the event is um the children made it mm -hmm. what it was because they were our first audience the children mm -hmm. and their parents and their families and then from there it just um it just started to catch on slowly not real quick i mean it's been 50 years mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's just wonderful to see where it's at today yeah i i have to tell you uh, again for the educators in the audience giving an opportunity to to demonstrate what you've learned is as important as the learning itself and that's what the that's how you started the festival was giving those students a chance to come out and perform and build on that sense that they were doing something that was making music for their parents, their mm -hmm. families, and the audience out there. And it was important from the beginning that every child knew that everybody was invited. You didn't have to pass a test and play it at a certain level. If you just had the desire uh, to come out and be a part of this and just just join us, that that's all. So mm -hmm. half the joy of it was, was seeing you know, if they played wrong notes, it was okay. It, right. That was kind of the beauty of it too. And I think, yeah, and, and that's why, you know, when people you ask, used to ask me in the early years, how come you don't have a competition? Because that's what I didn't want. I didn't want a first place, second place. I mm -hmm. just wanted everyone to come on and enjoy. That yeah. was the whole purpose of the ukulele festival. I think yeah. Jake had yep. raising his hand. Jake, go for it. Oh, yeah. No, I, I just wanted to chime in and, and just say, you know, because uh, 50 years ago, right, 51 years ago now. That's right. That's right. When Uncle Roy um, had this idea to put on an ukulele festival to celebrate this instrument that I think growing up in Hawaii, we sometimes take for granted because, you know, it's, it's everywhere. And we all kind of uh, we hear it all the time and we're around it all the time. Everyone thought he was crazy, you know, like, <laughs> what, you want to put on an ukulele festival? Why, you know, mm -hmm. and here in, in Hawaii, but he had this dream, you know, because he and, and later Kathy knew that, that um, this instrument, you know, could change the world. And if you, you know, I, I feel very fortunate. I have opportunities to travel now because of the ukulele and these different countries that i go to and cities around the world they all have their own ukulele festival you know they've all embraced this idea of the ukulele festival which which was uh uncle roy's vision you know way back in the day so i i just think i mean i i mean you know they i tell them all the time but you know i just have so much respect and admiration for both uncle roy and auntie kathy for their their passion their love for the instrument and what you don't see is how much work mm -hmm. goes into putting these uh these festivals together you know behind the scenes and they would it's really just the two of them you know more kathy too i think yes. <laughs> oh, yes. yeah, uncle roy will agree i mean she, yes. the, the, the day the day after the festival is done is when she starts working on the next yeah. festival yes because what people don't even realize is is the the day after six o'clock in the morning you have to register and reserve the venue for the following mm -hmm. year 
yeah. and they have never missed a year. You know, no. they have always been been right there. Uh, but you know, the other thing as, for me as as a student, uh, one of the things that I want to say is, as as a kid growing up and playing at at the festival, it was like the biggest thing. You know, it was it was like the the highest honor. You know, that you could receive as as a as a player was something that you practiced for and you you know and I was kind of laughing watching that video clip because I remember uh being one of those kids and you know you have to be there before six o'clock in the morning you know so <laughs> by the time they're up there playing you know they're so tired we're they're so tired but they're out there and giving their all right um but you know we get to play the the kids you can hear it in the background the the house band they're playing with with the 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 top session musicians in the world yes. I mean, I, you know, I, I couldn't see, but I'm sure it was Noel Okimoto on drums, who is the most sought after drummer. You know, he's based here in Hawaii, but he has played with everyone. I mean, any, anyone that comes to Hawaii, their first call is Noel Okimoto. You know, oh, in recent right. years, I mean, you, you have, uh, you know, uh, amazing musicians like, you know, I know Steve Jones used to play uh, bass, you know, um, uh, Dean Taba has been playing, you know, in, in, in recent years. Uh, Lyle Ritz, when I was Lyle starting, Ritz, Lyle Ritz, God rest his soul, has, yeah. Has been there. Benny Ritfield. Uh, Benny Ritfield. Yes. Um, I mean, you know, I mean, Lyle Ritz was, you know, in the, in the Wrecking Crew, the original Wrecking Crew yeah. <laughs> studio session. Uh, Benny Ritfield is Santana's, you know, music director. Um, you know, uh, uh, Dean Taba has, has toured and played with with every top jazz, you know, musician around the world. I mean, so it, it's like, you know, I mean, as a kid getting to get up on stage and play with this, you know, later on, as I became, a, 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 you know, a, as I matured as a musician, mm -hmm. I realized how fortunate I yes. was, you know, to have mm -hmm. that opportunity. And now I've, I've been very fortunate to even record and tour with Noel Okimoto, Dean Taba, and, you know, Steve Jones. And you know, so it's been, um, so I think that experience alone, you know, for these kids is just amazing. You're not going to get that anywhere else, you know. It goes beyond just the instruction that Roy and Kathy provide. It's the experience as a totality, as a package mm -hmm. that you've given them, Roy, Kathy. It's, it's fantastic. It, it truly is. Mm -hmm. Well, the ukulele festival is a free event. Mm -hmm. So we really depend on so many people like the performers now that Jake is so sought after, but all the performers from day one, they established a tradition of coming out and supporting the event and uh, coming out for free. And uh, everybody that you see they're working, they're all volunteers. So yeah. we have a tremendous uh, team, friends and supporters of big village of people helping us put this on. And There's it so is much love. At the no, go ahead. I was going to say, it's a party. Uh, I mean, the, <laughs> all the booths that are set up, the folks that come out, they picnic. You know, Roy, you alluded to it earlier. Kathy, you did. It's, it's a full day event. People come and spend the day just <coughs> enjoying it all. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Roy, you were going to say something. It's so funny that uh, Jake was saying how he appreciated the musicians, yes. the rhythm section. You know, I, I, I remember decades ago just, just telling Roy and saying, you know, Roy, one day these kids are going to grow up and, and they're going to realize what great musicians are backing them up. Because even I would be amazed, like, wow, we have these great musicians supporting us. And I'm thinking, the kids have no idea. <laughs> yeah. They have, the kids have no idea, but I, I believe, you know, it was, it was my passion that because we have people like Dean Taba and Noel, and these great uh, musicians on stage, it kind of freed me to make the arrangements a little more challenging, but the yes. kids went for it. And one thing I'd like to share with all the instructors out there is that we have four studios. So everyone is learning the, the old studios, but because of the way the music is written, they could all teach the same way so that mm -hmm. when you bring the four studios of children together for rehearsal, we have one rehearsal and that's it. Yeah. And boom, they get it, you know, so that, yeah. that, that's been so gratifying. And, and a lot of our instructors, you know, went on to become band teachers, music teachers. So that it's really a thankful of, and we have, we're so fortunate that Jake was, look what he's done with the ukulele. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Agreed. You guys, you've, you've given so many outstanding examples here. I, I, I want to ask the three of you, if you were to give advice to teachers out there, instructors, whether they be in schools, uh, public, private schools, or whether they be private teachers in studios like yourselves, Jake, you as a learner, what, what advice would you give to teachers and learners out there in terms of their moving forward with the ukulele? Should I go first? Go for it, I, I don't want. I don't want to follow Uncle Roy and Andy <laughs> I know they're gonna have some really <laughs> profound thing to say, and I'm just gonna be, oh yeah, yeah, exactly what they said. So, no, but honestly, I, I would, I would honestly just, just say to, um, I mean, it's, it's everything that, that you shared already, but, um, but yeah, I think just, just make it fun and inspiring, you know, and just don't get so fixated on the actual instrument. Mm -hmm. but you know but focus on on in, you know instilling the the love of of music the love of the joy of music i should say and putting that inside of them because once they have that you know then then they're always going to seek it they're always going to keep searching for it and that's that's what i think um you know of course uh, uncle roy gave me a really great foundation you know to to work on and gave me really good not just um not just technical skills and and the and the, the the music knowledge but he also gave me a lot of great um just life advice you know and taught me that you know just just taught me to 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 be a good person you know always try to make um i mean when when i first started out as a professional musician I would often go and see Uncle Roy and ask him, hey, you know, what do you think about this? Or he would give me, he would take the time to sit down with me and, and point out things from his experience. And those things, you know, even though they, they may not be related to chords I'm playing or, or mm -hmm. you know, things like that, you know, just um, that, I think that, that knowledge, that, that inspiration, you know, those words of wisdom, it all influences the decisions you make with your instrument as well mm -hmm. and how you perform with other musicians, how you interact, how you, um, you know, just how you just make your journey, you know, through, through the world. And I think that's the bigger, the bigger picture. So I'm, I'm so grateful for that. And like I said, you know, I just respect and have so much admiration for both Uncle Roy and Auntie Kathy, because not only are they great, teachers but they're amazing role models and mentors you know for our, our youth well said jake roy kathy mm -hmm. what advice would you give to teachers i i think to keep things simple and don't get discouraged if a student isn't progressing because um it's like reaching plateaus exactly you know once they you know that that moment will come when it'll just it'll just pretty much explode and then they'll and then they'll go through another plateau and then they'll reach another higher level um so simplicity and patience and just uh celebrating every um little success that students have to mm -hmm. keep them moving forward and enjoying music nicely said yeah i said yeah, you know, I was listening to Jake. So Jake, thank you so much. Because for me personally, um, if people knew the journey that I've been on, uh, then they would understand why I have such a passion for this. But in addition to teaching the children and to bringing joy to their life, um, all these young students that train with us, one of the things I always look for was, is there anything that's blocking them from opening up, from becoming more open? Because a lot of times we, we, we kind of put these secrets in us. And, and this is something that I've been talking about for the last 15 years, 15 years to thousands, tens of thousands of kids in schools. And I received thousands of letters from kids who wrote that something I shared may help them let go, let go of the things they were holding. And I find in life that when you help a youngster to let go of things that they shouldn't be holding on to, they become more open 
And you can see the glitter in their eyes or the smile when they come to the lesson. And that really um, brings uh, joy. And, and this is something that's important too in teaching. So I, I think what Jake said and Kathy said at the plateau, uh, we see that a lot in our studio, the kids go like this. And I know a child just recently wanted to learn Jake's song. She's only 10 years old. So I said, you sure? I said, okay. So I taught her while my guitar gently weeps. Next lesson, she comes back. I can play it. Jake, she memorized the whole song. <laughs> Love it. So, well, it, it, you know, I have to tell you, we have a, a really nice clip that we're setting up that Roy, you've just helped set up beautifully because beyond teaching notes, whether it's in standard notation or Sukuma notation, teaching is about so much more. And, and that's evident from this next clip. And, and following this, I want all of you to have a, a, an opportunity to speak to what it means to teach the person. Eric, please play the clip. Many, many, many years ago, uh, I, I wrote a song, the words that flowed out of me were, I am what I am. I am what I am, I'll be what I'll be. Look, can't you see that it's me, all of me. The words really simply mean that you know, we should be comfortable with who we are. And I didn't realize it until three years ago when I started my second journey in schools, talking to children about how we shouldn't tease, how we shouldn't bully and all these things. And little did I realize that as I would speak to these kids, that it was making sense to them. Because I started getting letters and Kathy would read these letters and she says, Roy, whatever you're talking, keep it up because you're getting the message across to the kids. I mean, bullies would stop bullying. And when I read those letters, I knew now that I could never stop. The name of our company is Roy Sakuma Productions, but really it's Roy and Kathy Sakuma because she keeps everything together. She keeps everything flowing. I am so thankful because she is the love of my life. And so we're, we're very blessed. Roy, I know that you're absolutely passionate about this. I know that this is something that is very close to your heart. Why don't I let you just talk a little bit about how this song that you've written and the opportunity you've had to speak to young people has, has touched you? You know, that song came to me in 1970. Uh, again, without going into detail, uh, I, 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 I had a really, really difficult childhood. And... And going through that difficult childhood, uh, many times I just wanted to stop living, give up already, just just stop. And one day I went in the backyard because I like to be by myself and I never sing, something like Jake, I don't sing. Everyone told me, don't sing, Roy, you don't know how to <laughs> sing. But I was playing melodies and all of a sudden I started playing the melody and I started singing. I am what I, it's, those words that you saw on the screen came out of me instantaneously. And I was shocked. I ran in the house and wrote the lyrics down and put down the melody on manuscript because I, I could write music. And and those words really touched me, but it it, it it somehow gave me strength to look forward. And yet I still didn't understand the words. But as, as time went on, I realized those words, I am what I am, I'll be what I'll be. Look, can't you see that it's me, all of me, is that we are all special. We are all special, and yet somehow many times we don't feel because we have a tendency to allow hurt enter us. Where actually we should let we should let angry words and bullying words just fly by us, but we tend to put it in. And if we can teach the children how to release it, they will change. They will understand and have a better chance of making good decisions in the future. Like Jake responded earlier, what is life's lessons? Mm -hmm. And so I Am What I Am um, is a song that I hope the whole world will embrace on the ukulele. And when I talk to kids and I ask them, what does the lyrics mean to you? The first thing I tell the children is, there is no wrong answer. And once they hear that, you will see the hands just go up. 
and everyone will have something to share what the song means to them. And it usually has a little touch of what something about themselves too, you know? It, it's just amazing. It's very touching. <laughs> Neat. Yeah, so good. Kathy, you obviously, Roy, paid a wonderful tribute to you. Very, very heartfelt. Uh, you've been part of this journey. Um, what what have you seen in the way that, and in your case, probably the teachers, even more than the students, what have you seen in terms of how it, uh, the program and the studio has touched, the ukulele has touched the lives of young people? I, it's hard to answer something like that because it's, I've often explained that it's like you have a child and they're born and suddenly they're five years old and you don't know how did they get to be five years old? And then they hit another milestone. They're graduating from high school and then they're getting married and now they're having kids of their own. You know, as that's going on, you're not thinking about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's funny that now we've hit our 50th, you know, that was a major milestone. Mm -hmm. We weren't even sure if we would even reach it. Uh, and so, and people ask, how does it feel now? It's um, we couldn't have planned for anything, uh, but we just feel very grateful and very blessed uh, that that uh, people are, you know, falling in love with the ukulele and it and it's continuing. It it hasn't stopped. It's mm -hmm. well, thanks to all of the people like Jake and all the young performers who are traveling mm -hmm. all over the world and sharing the ukulele, and, and I think more importantly, the aloha spirit of Hawaii. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. That in itself is very powerful. Jake, I'm gonna let you just speak to that briefly because you do go around the world performing and you know the aloha spirit come, goes with you wherever you go. And the same thing is Brian Tolentino, who I, I meet on tour, uh, Herb Ota Jr. Uh, the performers from Hawaii bring that spirit with them wherever they go. Uh, how how have you seen the ukulele and the the learning of it affect folks around the world? Yeah, it's it's, it's really interesting, you know, because I think it brings out um, a certain kind of um, it almost brings out like um, like this this um, feeling of of service, wanting to give back, um, kind of brings out the innocence and the childlike quality, you know, in, in a lot of people. And just in my experience, you know, uh, traveling to different cities and countries, and it's like a lot of them will have these ukulele clubs that they would randomly form and they would get together, you know, twice a month maybe. and do little potlucks and they would play songs but usually on the weekends they would meet up at like a senior care home or go to the you know the the hospital and play for some of the, the cancer patients or they would um, do some kind of community cleanup event or um, but it, it's it's amazing because you don't see a lot of that with with other instruments no you know and and so it's a beautiful thing to see. And I think um, I think the other thing that I like about it is, you know, there's there's not there's not um, there's no ego, you know, in playing the ukulele. It's just about like Uncle Roy said earlier, you know, he never wanted to have any competitive element at his festival because playing the ukulele is not is not a competition, right? It's just about it's just about bringing everyone together and celebrating mm -hmm. you know the love and the joy for the instrument um so i love that about the ukulele is that um is that ukulele players all over the world just kind of come together and they love to share and to collaborate and to play and that you know it's it's a little different sometimes with with other um instruments sometimes you know i can feel there's more of a competitiveness to it and mm -hmm. you know who's better or who can outshine the other person but i think with the ukulele you know you uh you don't have that which is very rare i think yeah. you in, know um, in musical circles for sure yeah, yeah so that that's that's something very special and and unique uh, that i i love about it 
I think a huge chunk of that may be just the origin of the ukulele from Hawaii. Uh, Kathy, Roy, you guys have a mission statement or a motto that reads, bringing laughter, love, and hope to children and adults of Hawaii and the world through the music of the ukulele. And that is indeed what you guys do through uh, the, the Roy Sakuma Studios. And it's what you do, Jake, when you go around the world carrying the banner for Hawaii, but also for the ukulele. So what's next for you folks? Roy, Kathy, 50 years. Uh, <laughs> I know that there's been a, a slight change in the way the festival is going to be run moving forward. Do you want to tell the audience out there a little bit about where that's going? You want to see? Well, you know, 50 years is a long time. So it's a lot of work. And as we get older, it gets a little tough multitasking. The brain just doesn't process the way it used to. But uh, Otasan had told me, um, the great master Otasan, he just said one, a few words to me. He said, well, you got to go to the 50th. <laughs> and I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> so 50th has come. And uh, we've been very um, fortunate to have met Craig Chi and Sarah Maisel. And they're going to be doing the actual uh, event coordinating uh, with Ukulele Festival Hawaii supporting them. So uh, we advise and counsel them. Um, we help them to learn. Uh, they'll be, we'll be mentoring them. And so they will be um, uh, putting, organizing the Oahu event. Hmm. We still do the outer island, uh, Maui and the big island. Mm -hmm. uh, but eventually, you know, Roy and I want to step back and also um, have the younger people take over that too. Mm. So it's a good time for the young ones because they're very uh, savvy with all this internet stuff that's going <laughs> on, <laughs> which is like a foreign language to us. Well, I, I'm hoping that, um, as I told Kathy, yes, we should, you know, after organizing this for over 50 years, but, uh, and, and she, Kathy knows this, that I have such a love for teaching that as long as I'm healthy enough, uh, I do believe I'll go on teaching because it's a passion in me. It's a passion to reach out and help people. Hmm. And uh, in my lessons, like Jake has alluded to, is that a lot of times without kids knowing or even adults knowing, I'm slipping in a life lessons message to, to just be subtly there, you know. And to all you teachers out there, you know, um, I was just thinking about this. I mean, if you have questions, I mean, I, I just not, can't email, but <laughs> but maybe what maybe what I can do, Peter. I don't know. Maybe uh, give a little four week course of how I approach and teach um, people to teach, and because uh, I have over fifty years of knowledge in my brain here, and to dissect every little thing on that instrument and w what your fingers are doing and what your hand mm -hmm. is doing and how to become comfortable. So I'm thinking about this now as we're talking, because I think it'd be a wonderful thing for them to see and learn. Well, I do we'll look for that. I to say too, huh? um, you know, with moving forward, uh, you know, yes, Roy will teach forever, as long as he can. But also uh, another change is we've, Jake is a new, board member of Ukulele Festival Hawaii. He All is right. a board of director uh, with Herb Bota Jr. has been added on. So they will be, um, you know, they'll, they're the future of ukulele mm. in Hawaii, mm. moving it forward. Well, that's exciting. Jake, do you want to make a comment or two about your, uh, your new role? I didn't know about that. Congratulations. Oh, yeah. No, it's a tremendous honor. I mean, I... Yeah, I, I, um, I'm still, I'm still in shock. So it's, it's, it's still pretty early on, you know, uh, you know, Herb, Herb Ota Jr. is someone I really respect, you know, his dad, Otasan was my biggest inspiration for playing the ukulele, um, as well, you know, and that the lineage of, of, you know, Uncle Eddie Kamai was like the first ukulele mm -hmm. virtual. So, you know, and then who, uh, taught Otasan and then Otasan passed on his knowledge to Uncle Roy and and then I was a student of Uncle Roy you know it's um you know for for Herb and I we were talking and 
we're just like so blown away to have been asked, you know, to be part of the board because the ukulele festival is, I mean, for us, it's like, you know, we always, especially after you're a student and you pursue a career, maybe in ukulele to be asked back to be a guest is like the highest honor, right? You know, so um, yeah, we were just completely blown away. And, uh, and you know, for, for her, I, I always believe, you know, it, it makes total sense. I mean, you know, he, he's family, you know, he, I mean, he's, he's like literally family because he and Kathy are actually cousins, <laughs> and, you know, so, um, you know, but I, um, yeah, for me, it was, you know, just a tremendous honor to be accepted, you know, because um, I just, I just think the world of the festival, it's given me so much, um, in, in my life, it's impacted me in such a tremendous way. And I wouldn't be playing the ukulele today if it weren't for Uncle Roy and Auntie Kathy. So, you know, that's, and that's the, the honest truth, you know, so I am, um, I'm just very grateful and, and humbled and I will, um, yeah, do whatever I can to support and to make sure that the vision, you know, that Uncle Roy and Auntie Kathy has had for the festival will, will continue and, um, yeah, so I'm so thank you, thank you, and I'm, yeah, looking forward to uh, to yeah. everything that that we have coming up our way. So. Well, I have to tell you, back in January, um, Believe in Music Week happened through NAM, the NAM Foundation. Um, as you know, NAM didn't happen in its usual format this last January. Mm -hmm. Uh, the NAM Foundation, through Eric Ebel and, and the folks there, have given a beautiful voice to the ukulele. They allowed uh, me to run a webinar last month that included my mentor, uh, Chalmers Doan, if you will, the Eddie Kamai in Canada, if you will, uh, who led to me, who led to James Hill, who and the world keeps going. And I, I want to thank NAM Foundation for opening this opportunity yes. to have dialogues. Um, I want to thank Eric for producing it. I know that the dialogue will continue right through next month will be Langley Ukulele. The month after that will be James Hill. The month after that, we're going to talk about helping folks choose festivals moving forward into next year, what we call post COVID. But for today, I want to thank the three of you. Um, Jake, obviously uh, you coming on as an affirmation for the uh, opportunity that Roy Sakuma Studios has provided uh, that you have become the musician and the phenomenal ukulele player that you are is a tribute, as you just said, to the fact that there was a school where you could go and attend. Um, to, to Roy and Kathy, you two are the dynamic duo, truly, of ukulele. <laughs> uh, and I, I have admired you since we had a chance to meet. You've given me an opportunity to come from Canada with kids from the United States with adults to perform at the festival. You have put on a first class event every time. Your connections to music, to music making, your impact on the community in Hawaii, but more importantly on the worldwide, the international community of ukulele players is second to none. And I wanna, mm -hmm. thank, I wanna thank all three of you for making this today a very special presentation. And I wish you well in all that you do in your future endeavors. And I look forward to seeing you soon in Hawaii. Thank you, thank Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so thank much. You. And thank you, Eric. And thank you thank to you. Eric. Thank Mahalo. You. Thank Mahalo you, Eric. to you guys. Thank you, Peter. Mahalo. Aloha. 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 We'll see everybody next month. You guys take, take good care.